Uh, it has been my great privilege as a minister of the gospel to be in and out of many homes of different believers. And that is a tremendous privilege to be in and out of people's homes. Uh, and often in such homes, you will find a framed text or a verse of scripture, maybe hanging on somebody's uh, wall or on the mantelpiece. And our Bible reading this evening contains maybe the most common mantelpiece verse in all the Bible. Joshua 24 verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Maybe it's up in your home. It's a great text. It's a brilliant verse to have hanging up on a wall. And as we continue our studies in covenant renewal, we're going to see it's one thing to have this hanging on your wall, perhaps. It is something else, though, to live it out day by day by day. We're gathering this evening, uh, seeking to prepare our hearts for communion this coming Lord's Day, uh, which is something of a covenant renewal meal. Uh, and we also seek to prepare our hearts for the following week, uh, when as members of this congregation, we come to the, the front of this building and we sign a covenant renewal document, uh, declaring publicly, corporately, our allegiance, our obedience to Christ, saying in effect, and, and really literally signing on the dotted line, as for me and this house, we will serve the Lord. We've looked previously at Deuteronomy 29 and 30, uh, an example of covenant renewal in Moses' day. Uh, we come this evening to Joshua 24, Covenant renewal in Joshua's day. Uh, just as Moses led the nation of Israel in a covenant renewal ceremony, uh, before he died, here's Joshua doing the exact same moments before he dies. So understand, uh, these are highly significant events uh, in the lives of the people of God it's not the first time Joshua has led the nation in covenant renewal. Uh, he's already done so back in chapter 8 of the book. Uh, when they've entered into the promised land, they undertook covenant renewal. Here he is again, though. And he's passing on the baton to the next generation. Uh, leading them again in this pattern of, of renewing commitment, uh, of Redeclaring their, their allegiance to the Lord. As for me and my house, he says, we will serve the Lord. And those words, those framed prints, uh, hang on your wall words, uh, they are covenant renewal words. Uh, words that come from the lips of a man who's well into his free bus pass years. Joshua. Uh, in fact, he's well into his telegram from the king years. Uh, we read verse 29. We didn't read the verse, but verse 29. After these things, uh, and it's, uh, it's implied that it's fairly soon after, he died being 110 years old. So what an example he is. And to every single one of us, not least those of us nearer the finish line than others. Here's an example of finishing well. That we must never think our work for God is done until our life here on earth is done. And here's this man. He's been a spy. He's been a soldier. He's been a general. He's been a statesman. And he's now the leader of this nation. And he gathers them all together, all the tribes. And he calls them, and indeed us this evening, uh, to consider uh, three things uh, from the chapter together. Firstly, our covenant story. This is verses 1 to 14. Our covenant story. 
Just like the example from last time in Deuteronomy, uh, so this covenant renewal ceremony, uh, it follows the shape of other covenants. It follows the pattern of other treaties that were around about in that time. Uh, Scholars and historians, uh, they've discovered something of a standard arrangement when it came to people making these covenants together and people entering into treaties one with the other. So we might not see anything noteworthy about the structure here, but Joshua's listeners certainly would have. Here were people, they were already in covenant with God. That's maybe important to underline. This isn't the start of a new arrangement. Uh, This isn't new relationship language happening here. Rather, it's a recommitment to an already existing relationship. It's a renewal of covenant relationship already in place. Joshua is about to leave them. And these people, they need encouraged to recommit themselves to serve the Lord. And Joshua begins and he spells out the history for these people. The history between the two parties, between God and these people. And actually, even before he speaks, the place in which he gathers them Uh, is highly significant. Uh, The place where this happens is full of nostalgia for the nation of Israel, full of history. Verse 1, he gathered all the tribes to Shechem. Now, 500 years before Genesis 12, it was at Shechem, this very place, that the Lord first appeared to Abraham. And the Lord told Abraham the place where he was standing uh, would become the possession of his descendants. It was here. And it was here where both Abraham and Jacob built an altar to worship the Lord, Shechem. It was also here where Joshua brought the Israelites in chapter 8 to renew the covenant back then, about 40 years previously to this occasion. So much like London to a proper Englishman is full of great history and nostalgia, so Shechem uh, to the Israelite was full of historical significance. And it's as if Joshua is saying, let's come here. (laughs) Look, it's here where the Lord made covenant promises before to our father Abraham. And God is faithful to keep those promises. Let's come to Shechem. Let's remember all that God has done for us here. And he does. He details the covenant story. Verses 2 and 3, he reminds them of how God took Abraham from a pagan family in a pagan land, how God gave Abraham so many descendants that he wouldn't be able to count them, How God took these descendants out of Egypt and through all the years in the wilderness. How God delivered them uh, time and time again in battles and conquests. You have different enemy nations listed time and time again. God gave the victory. And Joshua is reminding the people, this is all about what God has done for you. Uh, He even Phrases the language, verse 2, thus says the Lord. Uh, Joshua doesn't actually often speak like that. That isn't the way Joshua's speeches often started. Uh, That's prophet kind of language. Uh, God's spokesman kind of language. Joshua's the messenger now. And he says, this is all about what God has done. And actually, if you, if you look at just the way it's all phrased, uh, God is speaking through Joshua. I took, I led, I gave, I brought you out, I sent, I delivered you. It's very clearly about what God has done. The emphasis is all about God's actions. Uh, verse 12 underlines it very clearly at the end of verse 12 
It was not by your sword or by your bow. So Joshua is saying, come back, let's think of our history. And in case you have any temptation to look back and boast or brag or be filled or puffed up, don't think that you got here yourself. It is due to God alone. And so friends, as we think of our covenant meal together and our subsequent covenant recommitment, we do well ourselves to reflect on our covenant story. How everything we have, everything we are, is entirely of God. And where Joshua and these people, they went to Shechem. Where do we go? Well, it's good for us, isn't it, to, to go back to the manger in Bethlehem. It's good for us to go to the cross at Calvary. It's good for us to go to the empty tomb and to reflect on God's grace to unworthy sinners like you and me. Those are our Shechem's. How God's hand has been at work in our lives from before the foundation of the world. We can reflect ourselves as a, as a body of believers here on our covenant story. Most of you will know, uh, but for months, John Somerville has been working on a, on a history of the congregation. He's been putting together a booklet of our 40-year history. And what a helpful resource this will be for us as we prepare for covenant renewal. God willing, uh, you'll be able to get a copy this coming Lord's Day, a free copy for every home. Uh, what, a, what a helpful resource to look back and to be able to remember all the ways he's been so good, the covenant story of God's covenant people here. And so friends, as we come this coming Lord's Day as well, we could look back and think even since the last time we did so, our covenant story in those months, how God has guarded us, kept us, sustained us, the ups, the downs, through it all, he's been the ever faithful God. So Joshua calls the people, he calls us this evening, think over your covenant story. Your covenant story. The second thing, our covenant commitment. Our covenant commitment. This is verses 14 to 21. It is good to remember the past, but it's not good to live in the past. It has been said it's very difficult to walk forward when you're always looking back. And it's almost as if Joshua uses the historical background as a, as a springboard, as a launch pad for, for moving and propelling these people forwards. And that's a good way to think of our own history as well. He calls the people to a fresh covenant commitment. Verse 14 now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away those false gods and serve the Lord. Now, do you understand Joshua is not speaking to ungodly pagans here. He is speaking to the covenant community of God. A worshipping, serving covenant community. But he knows that in reality... Uh, their hearts are mixed uh, and, and they're serving other gods. And he's calling them for wholehearted, sincere service. Uh, Fifteen times in this section, uh, the word serve or service is mentioned. Uh, and he puts it very clear in verse 15, really saying, you're either serving the Lord wholeheartedly or you're serving other gods. You're either serving God with everything. Or you're serving other gods. You must give yourself. Completely. Utterly to God. Without any reservation. Put away anything. Uh, that might get in the way. Of your relationship with him. 
And the question comes to us this evening, and I ask you as I ask myself, what are the idols that you have in your life? Those little gods that are preventing you from serving the Lord wholeheartedly. Communion is a good time to examine ourselves afresh and to and to search our hearts for those subtle idols that we are so prone to serve. Joshua comes to this this evening. You've got to make a choice, he says. You can't serve those gods and the Lord. You can't have both. It's either or. And that's when he says those famous words, verse 15, As for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. And it's interesting, the way he states that the grammar of that that phrase uh, means this isn't a one-time decision for Joshua. Uh, This was a way of life. A way of life. He could have put it, I have chosen to serve the Lord, and I am choosing that service now, and I will go on choosing to serve the Lord. Joshua chose and chose and chose and kept right on choosing to serve the Lord. And that's the challenge, isn't it? Every day is a life of choosing to keep on serving the living God. It's not just a verse that you stick up uh, when you uh, get home from honeymoon and that's it. This is a day by day choosing to serve the Lord. And in verses 16 and 18, the people, oh, they respond very favorably. Verse 18, yes, Moses, we we also, or Joshua, we also will serve the Lord. He is our God. What a response. It's amazing. It is amazing. Joshua has been issuing this challenge. The people have responded Exactly as as you would think would be exactly what he wants. Really, this is every preacher's hope, every preacher's dream. And then verse 19 really should shock us. Verse 19, Joshua says, oh, oh, hang on. You are not able. (laughs) You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. Maybe their response was too quick. Maybe it was too unthinking, maybe too shallow. Perhaps Joshua heard a note of bravado or insincerity in their response. He says, look, look, you're not able to do this on yourself. This is beyond your power. This needs serious commitment. Uh, You actually need strength from beyond yourself. You need more than just enthusiasm. You need more than just hot air. You need the Lord's grace, the Lord's strength to be able to serve. And again, what a helpful reminder for us as we come to these two consecutive weeks of covenant renewal. As we remember promises, as we renew vows that we have made before. Joshua reminds us this evening, we are not able in and of ourselves To keep the promises that we make. We are not able in our own strength. To keep covenant with the Lord. We are prone to failure. And actually in the covenant renewal document. And there's still some copies on the table out there. uh, There is recognition of this. I know you will all have studied it very carefully. There's a section called covenant commitment. And, And really it's an expanded version of our vows of membership Uh, the four vows and really it's yeah the vows of membership plus Uh, but just before the four promises you have the words acknowledging our proneness to failure and our ongoing need for forgiving and equipping grace we pray the holy spirit would enable us to keep our covenant vows And that's really, really helpful. Acknowledging proneness to failure and our ongoing need 
for forgiving and equipping grace. It's only by the forgiving and equipping grace of God we can make any promises before the Lord. Otherwise, they're just too much for us. They're too difficult for us. Uh, We are too proud, too angry, too selfish. Jesus put it very simply, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. And Joshua's hearers then, they they respond in faith. Verse 21. No, we will serve the Lord. And that is to be our response in these days, friends. Uh, Recognizing our utter inability in and of ourselves. Casting ourselves on the Lord in covenant commitment. And saying in effect... As for me and my household, depending on this equipping grace, we will, we will serve the Lord. Covenant commitment. Covenant commitment. And then the third thing, our covenant witness. uh, Verses 22 to 28, our covenant witness. And this is very much uh, per the the typical covenantal pattern. Uh, Joshua enters into covenant. He writes with with these people. He he writes it all down and sets before them a covenant witness. There was always witnesses to the covenant ceremonies. Verse 26. He took a large stone saying to all the people, this stone shall be a witness against us. Now, that might seem a strange thing for us this evening. How can a stone be a witness to this covenant commitment? And yet you can think in this very building, there have been dozens of ceremonies at the very front of this building where words of covenant commitment are exchanged between a man and a woman. And a piece of metal is often brought forth and placed on a finger. And it's a witness in many respects. It's a testimony of those words of covenant commitment. An ever-present witness of vows that have been taken. Not something of the idea behind this stone Joshua sets up. This would be a perpetual reminder to the Israelites of what they have promised Of covenant commitment. And you should know our covenant renewal will likewise have a covenant witness. Joshua puts it in, in verse 22. You are witnesses against yourselves that you've chosen to serve the Lord. And the people respond, that's true. We are witnesses. So as we come to A covenant meal and covenant renewal. We do so, we remember, as a body, collectively, corporately, uh, witnesses of one another. And any time when uh, somebody receives the sign of the covenant, baptism, any time someone takes the vows of church membership, covenant vows, Uh, They do so in the presence of this congregation, in the presence of witnesses. So there will be witnesses over the next two weeks. But like Joshua too, uh, we will also keep a written record. Uh, you, You might already know, but before our meeting this evening, the elders, we met together. We constituted ourselves in a formal way for the purpose of overseeing the Lord's Supper. And we don't just do that for the fun of it. Uh, We don't just want to give Marcus some extra things to write up. But it is important that there is a record kept. A record of covenant renewal. Uh, There's a record kept of every time someone enters into church membership. Uh, There's a record kept of every time the covenant sign is applied to a little child or to an adult believer. 
And when we come to renew covenant together at the 16th of October, there will likewise be a record kept. Uh, The minutes of our session book will record something like 16th of October, covenant renewal. And just like last time in 1990, there will also be a document to sign here at the front of the church building. And your signature, it'll be there. And I'm sure we will find a space on the wall to get it displayed. And it will act as a witness. It will act as our witness stone. And every week we'll see it on the way in and the way out. And your signature will be speaking to you. John, Marcus, Dorothy, Alistair. Keep choosing to serve me. Keep choosing to serve me. Uh, This sign that points us to the covenant of grace. And just as the stone in Joshua's day would have spoken to to forth the future generations uh, of covenant commitment made, so our covenant renewal document That will be something of a testimony to generations that aren't yet with us yet. Generations yet unborn. And they will see and and they may well ask, what is that? And, And it will be a witness to them. And in these days too, as we think especially of the Lord's Supper, we have further covenant signs, don't we? Further covenant witnesses, if you like, the bread And the cup, covenant witnesses that speak of the body and the blood of the Lord. Reminders of covenant commitment. Reminders in some way of of our commitment to be the Lord's, willingly, wholeheartedly. But surely more so, reminders of his commitment to be ours. His commitment to be ours. He said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we are to proclaim and and even to be witnesses of the, uh, the Lord's death until he comes. To that end, may we know God's help. May we know God's blessing in great measure in these days of covenant renewal. Amen.